I'm Tom Brown, Director of Borderland Sciences, and uh, here we are in our new laboratory on the San Andreas Fault of uh, Northern California. What you just heard is a solar terrestrial report coming over radio station WWV on 10 megacycles, and we're using a fire hydrant for the antenna. And today we're going to explore Tesla's wireless power, and we're going to go around and show you various sites, mainly the Marconi Wireless Building at Bolinas, California and with Eric Dollar describe how wireless power works and how what's known as radio today really isn't what was happening back in the old days. So um, basically this is our lab now. Our previous videos have come from our top secret lab in the vast suburban wastelands of Southern California and now we're dodging the authorities in the bushes of Northern California. So uh, hope you have a good day as we travel around here. And here we see scientist Eric Dollard uh, in the Borderland Laboratory, which was pulled out of a ditch and restored. We have our solar terrestrial work here we're doing. You see the graph of sunspot activity okay. over the last rotation of the sun. Of course, one of our main Borderland projects is the study of the sunspots and their effect on atmospheric weather here on the Earth and on accident rates and earthquakes and a number of other things. So last rotation last month produced some rather major flares. Activity rose up rather high. Each one of these little lines up here indicates a flare that occurred. And it quieted down around the 22nd of January and started building back up recently, but this spot hasn't really panned out. Yes, last rotation. So this is one rotation around, and here's the next rotation. This rotation was the biggest of cycle 22 so far, with the solar flux reaching 399. No, 299. 299, yeah. right. No, the record in cycle 21 was uh, on October 15th, 1980, and I believe that was 320. So for being early in the cycle, it's pushing up pretty far. Now, what we've noticed in this cycle, where in cycle 21, the rainfall occurred on the downward solar flux, on this cycle 22, the rainfall is occurring on the upward. It's an indication that just rained the other day right here, and then we had a number of heavy storms last month right around this area here. So what this will do, when the overall solar cycle in another couple of years starts to drop down altogether, then we'll move into a period of drought. Interesting enough, right when it hit the bottom here, it started coming back up is when we had freak snowstorms and uh, record uh, they call it Siberian Express in the news, but that was when it happened, was right when it hit that low. Took the big drop down, and uh, up in Garberville, we were snowed in for about a week where it never snows. So let's go to our receiver here that we get our reports from. This is such a beautiful lab. I like this better than the last one. Yeah, it's free, too. That's what's nice about it. <laughs> okay, here we see the receiver's hooked up a little differently than normal. The antenna terminal of the receiver is connected to ground. And the receiver has a small Tesla coil inside of it for its ground tuner that allows us to pick up. Let's see what we can pick up with this. Now, of course, we know we can't receive through the ground because the scientists tell us this is impossible. So let's see what really happens. Of course, we've got WWV booming in, but that's only in Colorado. Let's see what's further up the band. Uh, Radio Peking is faint in the background. Let's 
see if we can find anything up here. What type of receiver is it? That's a uh, Army RT-77A shortwave receiver. Being that the receiver is sitting in the wet grass, it's not helping my reception any. Yeah, Peking just faded out. We'll have to move to a drier location. But of course, WWV is coming in loud and clear. So from Fort Collins, Colorado, we're picking up just fine out of the ground on 10 megacycles. Yeah, you can hear it good here. I think they'll As pick up. As you can up. see, there's really, there's no antenna here at all. I mean, all the wires, so, so the, close to the ground, the receiver is laying right on wet grass, even though there is a piece of plastic, the capacitance is still very significant to ground. The leads are very low inductance and straight to earth. So, so the uh, fire hydrant goes to the antenna leads? Yeah. Now, of course, right out here, we have the San Andreas Fault entering the Pacific Ocean. And this is one of the things that makes this a very conducive area for radio reception out of the ground. What's this bay here called? This is the Bolinas Lagoon. Bolinas Lagoon. This is the San Andreas Fault right. coming right up. The San Andreas up. Fault comes out of the ground here, basically, and into the salt water, right up behind those trees, and right. it goes into the ocean at this point. Now, of course, this was the place that Marconi chose to build one of his five power. Well, here we are in the antenna field of RCA Global Communications, or what's left of it. And uh, here's the book, The Theory of Wireless Power, by Eric Ballard. This is a paper that Eric gave at the USPA in 1986. And uh, this basically covers the setup at the Marconi Wireless Station and uh, the early pioneering days of radio. And uh, we're going to go through this book and explain parts of it and show you the different hookups in uh, the real world. So let Eric start going through it here and uh, we'll stop and start and go through the field and the old buildings and show you what's happening. Okay, to begin with here, in the principles of wireless power, in the period from 1890 to 1900, Dr. Tesla was engaged in the systematic research of high frequency electric waves with the specific aim of developing a method of transmission and reception of electrical energy without the use of connecting wires. Inspired by Dr. Heinrich Hertz's experimental researches into the Maxwell theory of electromagnetic waves, Dr. Tesla developed various apparatus with the object of exploring the developments of Dr. Hertz. Tesla found his progress slow until he developed his oscillating current transformer, which is now known as the Tesla transformer or Tesla coil, which allowed for his progress beyond the original experiments of Dr. Hertz and thus beyond the original theory of electromagnetism. That's what we're going to be dealing with here is a form of electricity used by Tesla and Marconi that is virtually non-electromagnetic and does not fit in the normal mass equations of physics today. Tesla found his dismay that it was not possible to demonstrate that the emanations from his oscillating current transformer were akin to the transverse vibrations of light waves as theorized by Maxwell, which Dr. Hertz, amongst others, sought to verify. At this point, Tesla began to doubt if the Maxwell theory had any validity at all. To quote, for more than 18 years, I've been reading treatises, reports of scientific transactions, and articles on Hertz wave theory to keep myself informed. But they've always impressed me like works of fiction, end of quote. What Tesla had discovered was that the emanations from his oscillating current transformer were of longitudinal dielectric waveform, that is, in the form of electric rays of induction. This indicated the purpose of Tesla's extensive research into X-rays and kindred forms of radiation, which were considered longitudinal waves in the lum lum this is a hard one. luminiferous ether by Tesla and his contemporaries. In other words, they felt that their transmissions were rays of induction propagating through a light-carrying ether. The theories of electric waves were of no concern to uh, Marconi, however, and by his adaptation of Dr. Tesla's fundamental patents, went on to establish commercial wireless communications. And we're on the piece of property now where he started that, and we'll see the building and the remains of some of the antennas very shortly. 
By 1919, Marconi completed construction of five high-frequency power plants around the world. These plants generated alternating currents at a frequency of 18,000 18, cycles per second, or in other words, 18 kilocycles, and were produced by 200 kilowatt motor generator sets. The alternators employed in these MG sets were fashioned after those developed by Tesla, but became known as the Alexanderson alternators after C.P. Steinmetz's protege, Ernst F.W. Alexanderson. These alternators delivered current to what is called a multiple loaded flat top antenna. And we'll show a diagram of this antenna here. Yep. Let's see if we can get that focused in. Get this focused in. Pull it right there. That's the diagram on the top there? Right. This is the um, layout, and this is the schematic diagram of the equivalent circuit. Right. So people that want to find out a little more about this can get the book to uh, see the pictures up close. So Marconi's arrangement was is a Pacific Gas and Electric installed a 60 kilovolt power line, which came down from Petaluma, about 50 miles away, was stepped down to uh, 2.4 kilovolts to drive very large 1,000 horsepower motors, which turned the 200 kW alternators, which were very inefficient because of their high frequency and required water cooling and whatever. So that's why basically it took about 750,000 watt motor to drive a 200 kilowatt generator. Now this was stepped up with a large resonant transformer, or what would be called the Tesla coil, and connected to a very large screen buried in the ground and a very large screen suspended in space. And we'll see the old concrete platforms that held the towers for this. And as we go through, we'll draw a diagram of this thing and come up with an uh, overall picture of it from our, you might say, archaeological observations of the field. You know, this is the equivalent circuit of the traveling wave which the generator produces on this line which can be seen to be a lot more complicated than the conventional equivalent circuit of a transmission line. We have the inductance of the wires going out to the end of the antenna, and then we have the capacitance of that plane of wires to the capacitance on the ground, which is the ground sheet down here. And of course, this connects to plates buried in the Pacific Ocean also to assure its, its ground connection. And of course, as we saw earlier, the San Andreas Fault comes right through this area to help facilitate this. Okay, now with the Marconi system, we have the mutual induction into the ground of magnetism, and we have the atmospheric induction of dielectricity up to the ionosphere. So basically, we have Tesla's atmospheric and Tesla's Earth type of transmissions occurring off of this antenna. As we have lines of force going up to the ionosphere from the elevated plate, and we have lines of magnetic force coming off of the lower plate down into the Earth. So continuing here, upon completion of these wireless plants in 1919, the U.S. government established the Radio Corporation of America with General Sarnoff as its head to take control of the plants constructed upon U.S. territory. The RCA Marconi Wireless Company and others went on to develop wireless, or what's now known as radio, communications based upon the transverse or Hertzian waveforms. The culmination of this transverse wave and antenna was known as the RCA Type D Director, later to, know, be, later to become the well-known rhombic antenna, which we're standing under right now. It's a number of these rhombic antennas. If we can get a shot up here, we can see the corner of one okay. and the end point. Okay. And then we have Let's diagrams of it here. And this shadow we're looking at here is also the shadow of one of the poles we're standing in. Yeah, you get an excellent shot right up the side of the pole here if you can get the camera vertical enough. Okay. So here's the overall plan. Good time to focus. Of the rhombic antenna. Okay. So you can see it's a diamond shape of wires, which basically is an extension of the transmission line spreading outwards to fill more space and then a resistive termination at the end. And here we have a side view of it where the wires are stretched out, but we only can see the thin edge, and then the waves branch off at an angle from that. And then we have the equivalent circuit. 
Again, we have the inductance of the wires going down, and then we have the capacitance between the wires as they spread out. But now we have new elements. We have the conductance, which loses energy due to the dielectric hysteresis of the ether that the antenna fills. And we have the resistance representing the consumption of energy from the magnetic hysteresis of the space between the wires. So in the Marconi system, which was an adaptation of the Tesla system, there is no effective resistances or effective conductances. So these antennas didn't lose any energy. The 200 kW, which the antenna did absorb at losses, was greatly overcome by the fact that 2,000 million watts of circulating reactive energy pulsated in this antenna at 18 kilocycles a second. The stored energy in the antenna was so great that even at 15 words per minute of telegraphic keying, the antenna would ring like a bell and tend to slur the telegraphic impulses together. Now, of course, this antenna only wants to operate on one frequency, being that it is resonant in such a fashion. Now, this antenna is aperiodic as far as its frequency response and doesn't respond to any one particular frequency. It's wide band and absorbs all of the power, from this case, this being a 15 kW shortwave transmitter, absorbs all the power and losses, and no energy is really stored in the antenna. So we have two distinct differences here. The Tesla system uses no energy other than incipient losses. The Hertzian system represents total energy loss. So we're starting to come up with a fundamental difference between what Tesla was working on and what we have today. Reading from the text a little further here. Okay, these developments, the developments of Marconi and RCA, fully entrenched the use of Hertzian waves in the practice of wireless communications, thereby diverting interest from the waveforms discovered by Dr. Nikola Tesla. Tesla's progress in commercial development was further delayed by his absolute assist insistence upon establishing a, per a perfect system, the world system, as he called it, of wireless power and communications. The world system was much more costly and complex than the simple makeshift installations of Marconi. To quote Dr. Tesla's thoughts about the developments of wireless in this point in history, the commercial application of the art has led to the construction of larger transmitters and multiplication in their number. Greater distances had to be covered and it became imperative to employ receiving devices of ever greater sensitivity. All these changes have cooperated in emphasizing the trouble and seriously impairing the reliability and value of the plants. To such a degree has this been the case that conservative businessmen and financiers have come to look upon this method of conveying intelligence as one offering but very limited possibilities, and the government has deemed it advisable to assume control. This unfortunate state of affairs, fatal to the enlistment of capital and healthful competitive development, could have been avoided had electricians not remained to this day under a delusive theory, the Hertzian theory, and had practical exploiters of this advance not permitted enterprise to outrun technical competence. End of quote. Dr. Tesla remained unswayed by these commercial developments and their impact upon scientific thought. Tesla understood that transverse or Hertzian waveforms were useless for the transmission of electrical energy on an industrial scale. The scattering, dissipative nature of these waves represents the primary limitation to efficient energy transfer. To quote Dr. Tesla again, nothing illustrates this better than the recent demonstrations of a number of experts with very short waves, which have created the impression that power will eventually be transmitted by such means. In reality, experiments of this kind are the very denial of the possibility of economic transmission of electric energy." End of quote. This, of course, brings to mind the satellite program of beaming microwave energy down to the Earth in electromagnetic form from photocells collected, collecting the energy in outer space, which, of course, is something that will never really be practical. Okay, discussing the Tesla system. The Tesla system of transmission and reception of electric energy without the employment of connecting wires or waveguides, as conceived by Dr. Tesla, is not the propagation of any type of electromagnetic wave, nor is it the excitation of the Earth ionosphere waveguide. 
The Tesla system employs resonant actions along lines or rays of electric induction. These lines standing between transmitter and receiver, as we can see here in figure three. So here we have the transmitter, and then we have this. Get straight in here. We have the transmitting station, supply of energy. We have an elevated capacitance terminal uh, standing up Shadows in space. In there. And then we induce this with a ground screen into the earth. Now a standing wave, which here is, is symbolized by a caduceus coil, travels between the transmitter through the earth to the receiver, through the receiving transformer, bounces off of its capacitor and is sent back to the transmitter. Now this energy constantly bounces back and forth and no supply is delivered until a demand is put at the other end. So there's really no loss in transmission in the Tesla system until you put a load on the receiving device and then enter a, a traveling wave of energy will come up here. The way we can look at this is we have a traveling wave of energy supply going from the transmitter to the receiver as indicated by this vector and then a traveling wave of energy demand going back. And of course, if there's no energy demand, then the energy just oscillates in between. Okay, returning to the text my place here. Okay, the Tesla system, as we pointed out, employs lines of electric induction, or what we could call Faraday lines, lines of electrostatic and lines of magnetic force. The, the apparatus for establishing these lines of induction is called the Tesla magnifying transmitter, or which lately has been abbreviated as TMT. The monopolar nature of this TMT, or Tesla magnifying transmitter, facilitates the ease of transmission and reception of this apparatus. In other words, we're dealing with a one-pole electrical system rather than the normal two-pole electrical system. The TMT consists basically of a system of resonating transformers harmonically balanced to the electric condition of the Earth, or what you would say would resonate to the Earth's own electrical system. The lines of induction established by the TMT are drawn into the high inductivity of the Earth's interior despite the conductivity of its surface, which would screen electromagnetic waves. To illustrate this point, consider Tesla's description of an experiment. To quote, I have here a short and wide glass tube, which is exhausted to a high degree and covered with a substantial coating of bronze, the coatings allowing barely the light to shine through. The metallic clasp with the hook for suspending the tube is fastened around the middle portion of the ladder the clasp being in electrical contact with the bronze coating. I want, now I now want to light the gas inside by suspending the tube on a wire connected to an oscillating coil. Anyone who would try this experiment for the first time, not having any previous experience, would probably take care to be quite alone when making the trial for fear that he might become the joke of his assistants. Still, the light bulb lights in spite of the metal coating and the light can be distinctly perceived through the latter. A long tube covered with an aluminum bronze coating lights when held in one hand, the other touching the terminal of the coil and lights quite powerfully. It might be objected that the coatings are not sufficiently conducting. Still, even if they were highly resistant, they ought to screen the gas. They certainly screen it perfectly in the condition of rest, but not by far perfectly when the charge is surging in the coating. But the loss of energy which occurs within the tube, notwithstanding the screen, is occasioned principally by the presence of the gas. Were we to take a large, hollow, metallic sphere and fill it with a perfect, incompressible, fluid dielectric, there would be no loss inside the sphere. And consequently, the inside might be considered perfectly screened, though the potential would be very rapidly alternating. Even were the sphere filled with oil, the loss would be incomparably smaller than the fluid replaced by a gas, for in the latter, case the forces produce displacements, that means impacts and collisions on the inside." End of quote. The dielectric induction through the interior of the earth communicates the energy from the transmitter and receiver as shown by figure four. These are Tesla's original drawings, by the way. Okay, we're going to have to uh, focus in again here. Can you hold that a little straighter?
Well, people watching this realize the conditions we're filming under. Yeah, it's kind of hard when you have to do everything in the bushes. Okay, I think we got it there. We can see in this one the pump with okay, the, the little the, meters. The pump represents the Tesla magnifying transmitter. And the earth filled with gas is a large balloon, in this case, with little pressure gauges installed all over the place. Now, what Tesla is showing here is when you set up oscillations with the pump, that the pressure, gauge, re pressure gauges respond almost instantaneously all over the surface of this hollow globe. Now he has a schematic diagram here showing the coil with its elevated terminal, which if high enough, such as a broadcasting tower, will radiate in a Hertzian fashion. But then he shows the neutral terminal, the coil coming off the Earth, and infinite propagation velocity occurring outwards slowing down to the velocity of light at right angles on the planet and then speeding up to infinite velocity all the way around, the average velocity being pi over 2 times the velocity of light, which, of course, to modern relativistic theories is impossible. Tesla has the practical realization listed here of replacing the hand pump with one of his wireless towers, which contained a large elevated capacitance terminal and a ground system with a coil in between being excited and, of course, light bulbs being lit up out of the ground, which is kind of hard to see here in the photocopy, and ships receiving out at sea and submarines and the whole thing being receiving both their power and their communications by this centralized transmitter tower. So returning to the text. Okay, we were talking about the dielectric induction through the interior of the Earth bouncing from transmitter to receiver. The unused portion of the energy is reflected back to the transmitter more or less completely, as, as we discussed a little earlier in the schematic diagram. Operating this energy reciprocation between the transmitter and receiver at the natural period and wave shape of the Earth's own energy pulsation rate greatly overcomes the effect of distance. Hence, no significant loss of energy is apparent. Thus, a standing wave of, induct of inductive energy exists between the transmitter and receiver, or what more, more, might more rightly be called transponders in this case, all pulsating at one of the Earth's natural harmonics. If the phase angle of the Earth pulsation frequency lags the phase angle of the pulsation frequency of the system, energy is abstracted from the Earth's own energy supply and delivered as free energy to the transponders. This is what eventually led Tesla to the claim that he felt free energy was around the corner, as all of his contemporaries felt. They seriously believed that by 1900, there would be no more reason to burn any fuel. Every major electrical researcher was sure of this at this point in time. I wonder why we don't have it today. It therefore can be seen that while transmission of transverse waves involves the spraying of energy, with its consequent square law diminishment of energy density and no hope of retrieving the unused energy, the Tesla system involves a direct connection of transmitter and receiver via pulsating lines of electric induction. Therefore, the transmitter and receiver are rendered as one apparatus. Now, what we're going to do is go around and look at the remains of some of this stuff and show you some of the RCA antennas and even later get into exactly how this ties in with living energy and the archetypal patterns of plants and the flow of the ethers in nature. So this ends this section of our talk, and we'll move on to the Marconi building. Okay, we're just going to do a 360-degree pan shot of the antenna field here. Okay, now what's this one up here, Eric? Okay, that's the point of one of, one of the rhombic antennas, this one being directed at Australia. And being that this is the transmitting end of it, the, um, as we come down the tower, we see it, the smaller transmission line poles there, and those have resistance right. wire on them, and that's the resistor termination for the transmitting end of the antenna. The input end of the antenna is on the back and can't be seen from this end. And this is the other Australian rhombic here. OK. And as we pan around, we can see the 60 kilovolt power line coming in along the road here. 
and what's left of the antenna field, most of it is all falling down. We'll get a closer shot of that later. You just want to get the 360 degree And then pan. we have a whole array here of what's left of the Asian rhombics pointing between China and Japan. Okay. And there's the building facilities down there. We're just going to do a 360 pan here. Okay, now these two buildings you see, the one to the left farther back is the original Marconi wireless building. And the one on the right is RCA communications. Right, now an important thing that we'll get into later is you'll notice the two buildings are not on the same line. The RCA building is built on the north-south-east-west axis, but the Marconi building is orientated along the axis of the San Andreas Fault. And we'll see this more clearly later. Okay, we were just up that canyon there originally. We've worked our way down here, and now we're at the end of the uh, antennas, the original antenna array. So here we are at the end point of the original Marconi antenna system, which of course was stripped down shortly after World War II. The generators here, of course, being in the building. So we're going to work our way down, and one of the original ground screens is still left further down the way, so we'll do a few experiments there to see what we can pick up out of the ground. And then we're going to work our way down to the Pacific Ocean where the ground plates were at. Even though we won't be able to see the ground plates, we will be able to see some of the wires that used to go down there. And we'll see some other things, too, that we'll bring up. So right here is the base where one of the 300-foot columns or posts stood that held the Marconi umbrella antenna, or what used to be called multiple loaded flat top antennas. Another one of the posts is down there and another one's behind us. We can see these uh, hexagonal coil forms here over to you, our... You have to... can't move things that fast or we won't be able to focus. Here, actually, we've got a coil form right up over there. That was the base for about a seven-foot high coil, one of the loading coils, and there's a number of them around here that were hooked in parallel to handle the heavy currents. We have a, a plan here. If we drew up this area where we're at now, and as we move down the antenna field, we'll draw up the whole plan of the thing. Okay, focus in here. We have the three posts in a line. Okay, and down the page is will be our progress down the field to the building, which will be down at the bottom here. So then we have the coils here, and then there were smaller transmission line type poles that held wires between the coils, and then down leads came down off the flat top to these tether points that we see here still sticking out of the ground. This is the big concrete? Uh, the uh, little metal posts sticking out with the, uh, oh, I see. the bolt going through them. The big concrete pads, one of which we see off in the back there, were the guy wires that held these tall posts up. Right, we have a triangle of these around this point here. And to get an idea of the overall height of the post behind you there, Tom, is one of okay. the, the transmitting towers that's still in operation that is also 300 feet high. Okay, we'll slowly pan around to that here. You can see the red and white tower down there, which is the same height that these poles were. Actually, it's 15 feet higher. That's a 315-foot tower. So we'll extract a little more information from the text here and move our way down to our next section of the operating principles behind the Tesla system. Wind is picking up a little difficult for us. So reading from the text, we're now to part C, the operating principles of the Tesla magnifying transmitter. Because the energy is propagated through the ground, the question exists as to how, the, how to ground the apparatus, that is, how to establish an electrical reference point. Since the so-called ground is now the hot terminal of the transponder coils, or the TMT coils, and therefore is incapable of also serving as an electrical reference point, here exists the singular feature of the Tesla oscillating current transformer, in that the distributed mutual inductance and the odd order harmonic resonance work to establish a virtual ground. This is the fundamental principle 
of virtual grounding, or this fundamental principle of virtual grounding is also found in the Tesla geodynamic oscillator, which serves as the mechanical analog to the Tesla magnifying transmitter. The principle behind this basically is the geometrical reconfiguring of the fundamental components of energy, the components called the kinetic and the potential. This reconfiguration resulting in the separation of cause and effect, not only in time, but also in space. The result hereof is the circumvention of the Newtonian laws of action and reaction. This allows for the production of heretofore unexplainable phenomena. Hence, the, traveling way, or the, the Tesla magnifying transmitter, as well as the Tesla geodynamic oscillator, is capable of transmitting vibrations by the virtue of the fact that it is self-referencing, thereby not requiring any ground, that is, no solid backing from which to push against. This may be loosely related to the old saying, give me a fulcrum and I'll move the earth. Tesla found this fulcrum and moved the earth literally and mechanically in New York, producing a localized earthquake, and electrically producing a standing lightning discharge at Colorado Springs and possibly conjugate discharges elsewhere on the planet. The tra Tesla transponder or Tesla magnifying transmitter can be divided into five distinct components. One is the earth. Two is the reflecting capacitance, or the ball that exists on top of the coil. Three may be called the energy transformer, four the coupling transformer, and five the resonant coil. Now we have these in a diagram here, if we can focus in on them. Okay. Okay, we have the Earth here, represented as this sphere, and L is the inductance in Henry's and M is the mutual inductance in per Henry's of the Earth, giving the, the dimensional coefficients of that wave which propagates through the Earth. Now here we have what's usually called the secondary of the, the transformer that excites the Tesla coil. We can call this unit here, number four, is the coupling transformer, which takes energy from the energy transformer, usually consisting of a capacitor and a generator, and its own localized ground, which is symbolized by the box, and also connected to the Earth terminal. So again, we have L, the inductance of the coil, and M, the mutual inductance in per Henry's in this case, coupling through to this. Now, on the other side of this transformer, this being a fairly conventional constant current transformer, with again, one terminal to the Earth, the other terminal connects to the oscillating or Tesla coil. Now, this is the one that produces the virtual grounding. And then at the terminal point, that is a small sphere, or if the voltage is not very high, you can just use a scrap of wire without any corona effects. Now, the M in this, again, is the mutual inductance within the coil, and the K is the mutual capacitance within the coil, the mutual inductance being in per Henry's and the mutual capacitance being in per Farad's, and that gives the character of the wave propagating through the coil. So what we have overall here is basically a power supply, a generator to produce the energy, a capacitor to produce the magnetization, a transformer. This one terminal of the secondary of the transformer is connected to the Earth. The other terminal connects to the virtual ground. So in this case, the Earth is hot and this point is grounded. So we have a backward situation here, quite unlike the way radio operates today, where this coil is eliminated and replaced by a tall tower, such as the one we saw down there. And the Earth just simply serves as the grounding point and doesn't really operate as a propagating medium for the electrical waves. Okay, we've just shown the interconnection of these. In, the arra in this arrangement, energy is continuously bounced back and forth between the Earth and the reflecting capacitance at a rate tuned to the natural rate of the Earth. The standing wave of energy pulsation is maintained by the energy transformer, which delivers the electric energy to the standing wave via the coupling transformer. A certain percentage of this energy in the standing wave is refracted through the Earth transformer reflection point and into the Earth. This refracted energy establishes another standing wave in the Earth. Hence, a, a pair of standing waves are produced which communicate energy through refraction. The oscillating resonant coil, or the Tesla coil, tuned to an Earth harmonic, establishes a virtual ground at one terminal of the coupling transformer, thus rendering the Earth terminal active from the standpoint relative to the electric conditions surrounding the apparatus. The coil terminal, designated as the reflecting capacitance, appears active 
that is, appears active, and the Earth terminal appears to be neutral, whereas from the Earth's standpoint, the Earth terminal is active. Thus, the reason for the popular notion that the reflected capacitance, or the ball on the top, is the output of the apparatus. In light of the virtual grounding theory, this is obviously not correct. Now, referring to figure number six here. You have to focus in again for it. You can only come around the light a little more like this, so just kind of keep your head out of the shadow okay. there. So. so in conventional radio system, we have the supply of electric energy. We have the transmission lines conveying this energy to a coupling transformer. One side of the coupling transformer is connected to the earth ground, usually a large copper screen buried in the ground, and the other end connects to the tower. In the Tesla wireless system, we have an entirely different arrangement. Again, we have the supply of energy and transmission lines to carry that energy to the coupling transformer. But now, rather than radiation from a tower and the consequent loss of energy, we have induction in the earth and a virtual ground. So we have a one terminal situation here, where here we have a two terminal situation. The overall Tesla wireless system only has one point, where the overall conventional or Hertzian system has two points. The electric conditions surrounding the Tesla magnifying transmitter can no longer be represented by conventional or electromagnetic con. Okay, we had a minor glitch there. Our battery went dead, and thanks to some friendly RCA employees here, uh, we're now recharged and running again, so we'll continue. So we were discussing the conventional dimensions of electromagnetic energy, mass times velocity squared, but around the Tesla magnifying transmitter, we find the energy has different dimensions of length cubed divided by time squared. We find this mentioned in some of Wilhelm Reich's later works, and we even find in Maxwell's works that there is a type of energy he considered to be mass-free and of the dimensions of length cubed divided by time squared. So what we're dealing with here is the Tesla transformer not only generates monopolar types of electricity, not only does it generate its own ground, but it produces an organic lifelike form of electricity. This dematerialized energy is the spatial analog of reactive or wattless energy that's encountered in alternating current systems. Plasma discharges resulting from dielectric saturation, or what's known as dielectric breakdown, of the dielectric medium that surrounds the TMT no longer can be related to the laws of thermodynamics, but are related to the laws of organic growth, such as the spontaneous production of energy and golden ratio proportioning. It's a particular interest to note that these phenomena serve as experimental verification of the cosmic superimposition theory put forward by Dr. Wilhelm Reich. Now what we're going to do is, is show some pictures of our laboratory coil here, exhibiting these discharges. We're going to set them on here so they're going to be steady. Pull out some of the best here. Some of these are multiple exposures, so you have a hard time seeing, okay, but now, we can let's see. Let's go slow and let me focus. Okay, we have our basically our extra coil or Tesla coil here. And rather than the capacitive ball on the top, we've put a point so we can get a breakdown. Now we can see we have rather substantial current flow here. This is being driven by a vacuum tube power amplifier. We have a current of, of maybe up to a few amperes flowing at this point, but not really having any other terminal to jump to. And even though the voltage is rather low, the insulator here being six inches long for reference, we find that we have arcs much longer than normally occur with two-point discharges at normal power frequencies and with two-pole transformers. Now here we have a single burst. Now one can notice here there's some very characteristic patterns that occur, such as the arcs always curve at the same angle. And they have like little antenna on them. They tend to look more like life forms. And we'll find when we take photographs of some of the life forms and things that are happening around here in the field, we'll see that there's an analogous proportion involved. This next photograph here is the coil tuned off to the side so it produces a more fluffy discharge. Here we have a good one here with the coil at resonance. Again, we can see the, the characteristic or what we might call the archetypal curve. Now these tend to form spirals you might call a critically damp spiral because it never makes it around more than 90 degrees. These are all based on what's called the golden ratio, a geometric proportioning found everywhere in nature, which basically is 
division of the circle by five, or 36 and 72 degree angles of proportioning. This is a more continuous high frequency discharge that so produced multiple exposures. There was a very short pulse burst. And again, you can see the curvatures, and here's one facing towards the viewer here. So you can see it going up and curving down. I think we're going to see a bush that looks viewer. like this in a little while. Yeah, we're going to see a, a small cypress tree where we have our ground receiver set up that looks just like this. And then we're back to where we started from again. Now, also what we have is when we have two of these coils operating 180 degrees out of phase, producing a dematerialized field of electrical induction in between them, that when this field is applied to even conventional street lights, as we have here in the photograph, we have old burned out street lights that we get from LA Water and Power. I'll wait this down here, we got a bit of a breeze, even though usually it's gale force winds on a day like today. We can see that the inside of the light bulb looks much different than it does when driven by conventional electrical oh, forces. We can see distinct ball lightning phenomena have appeared. Now these things tend to provide their own energy and self-support themselves in this field of induction, usually traveling in spiral motions, which of course can't be seen on the still film. Put this in here. A number of these pictures are overexposed and what have you, so we'll just have to weed through and see what we can like find here. The glare out of the shadow. There this we go. one is not quite as revealing. You can see the light bulb more at the distance here. Here's the pilot lamps for the two pilot coils. Pilot lamps and the two coils actually were set up like this. Our two coils are standing to the side here. Mm -hmm. And the pilot lamps are down on the bottoms of the coils. Right, we had the bulb on a long wooden stick. Okay, and these are all overexposures. Right. Weed through those. Here again, we can see the independent spheroids of, of contained plasma. Yeah inside the bulb under exposure there. Now sometimes these spheroids of plasma will aggregate and form what looks like an actual spiral galaxy inside the bulb. We have been able to catch that on film yet. But nevertheless you can see many phenomena going on in this bulb that are very reminiscent of color photographs of deep space. Right. We're about two months from having this apparatus running at full power when uh we ended up in the bushes here. With yeah, we land. lost funding in our laboratory, so we had to move into the bushes. So we can't really do this stuff anymore, but we can talk about it and show where it, it originally happened. Again, you can see distinct ball plasma phenomena, which, of course, physicists have been trying to do for many decades now with no avail. Again, we have very bright spheroids here. Now, mind you, this is just a conventional light bulb. We've gone through no effort to optimize any of the gas or ionization or the shapes of the electrical fields. These are, were our initial experimental results. So as you can see, as crude as we're working here, we've already made very good progress. Now, here's an overexposure that shows the two coils and the field of induction exciting the light bulb. Now, there's a neutral sheet which rides between these two coils. We'll see in some of the photographs how it affects the glow in the bulb. That is the area of dematerialized electric energy. See the arc brightens up a little bit there in that plane. We'll see actual distinct color and geometric pattern changes in that area. Here we have one here. Very the bright bottom. area building up a non-electromagnetic discharge. You can see the organic patternings here as the discharges impress themselves against the glass. Again, in the neutral plane, a ghost-like image appears, which usually coalesces into a plasma spheroid, which displays the characteristics of being self-powered. Also, the bulbs explode under pressure, oftentimes in this, which is interesting because inside the bulb, of course, is a partial vacuum. And even once we had the plasma maintain itself after the disappearance of the bulb, the plasma maintained itself for a brief period in between the two coils, forming its own pressure relationships to keep its boundaries, which, of course, is supposed to be impossible in free space. Here we have a clear example here of the blue being the conventional plasma breakdowns in the dielectric field, but then in the neutral plane, it reverses its color and becomes a bright yellow or orange. And again, down at the bottom, it's very distinct. And this is, this is the point that will usually leave the discharge and under almost its own power circulate around in the bulb in kind of a hydrodynamical fashion. 
Here we have a very interesting discharge. It produces a pattern somewhat like looking out of a window into a sunlit road with trees and what have you. It's almost a crystal ball effect here. The organic patterning has become so complicated. Yeah, I think we're kind of getting back to where we started. Well, here's nice an one. interesting one here where the, the bulb uh, is less rarefied. The atmosphere of the bulb is under higher pressure. We get thinner, this more vein-like discharges. This was also on a single coil, too, before it was a double coil. Oh, these are the dome laboratory. Right. Yeah. Okay. Here we these have uh, multiple, ex good, multiple so. exposures, but one might be able to see a number of very interesting patterns have appeared in the bulb here that look almost lifelike. And pretty much, redundant here. yeah, we're pretty much the same thing. So what we're going to do now is we're going to move further down the line of the old Marconi wireless antenna to our ground receiver. This concrete piece we're on, what did that hold? These held up the big loading coils. Ah. And the next series are down down the way there as we make progress towards the building and down to the beach. There's the RCA building where we just charge our battery. Okay, we've moved on to the next set of posts here. Okay, concluding with our text. Basically, it can be seen that the Tesla magnifying transmitter involves three distinct standing waves in its operation, each coupled to the other through two points of refraction. Each of these standing waves represents a distinct dimensional aspect. We have the Earth wave, which is a space dimensional aspect. We have this standing wave of energy bouncing between the transformers, which is a time dimensional aspect. And then we have the resonant coils wave, which is extra dimensional, which is the electrical wave that's received very little attention. We have our diagram here of our various waves. Okay, let me focus in here, okay. We have the wave in the earth. We have the wave through the transformer and the wave from the energy supply. All these waves combining together in the coupling transformer. So the Earth is the spatial wave, the coupling being an alternating current type of situation is a time wave, and then the resonant actions and virtual grounding of the extra coil or Tesla coil represent the outside of the dimensions of space or time, or the extra dimensional. Or what we will find later, as we research this stuff a little further, what we might call a counter spatial electrical field. The analogous relations in musical representation of these would be the space dimensional is what's called harmony, where a number of tones combine to produce chords, which in themselves are spatial phenomena or geometries that appear in space. The time dimensional, of course, would be the rhythm of the musical situation, and the melody would be the extra dimension, in that melody involves the process of change, and there isn't a specific thing that you can grasp to define it as a physical dimension. In order for this triplet resonant or sextic energy transient, in other words, six distinct forms of electric energy to operate in consonant resonance, conjugate relations must made to be existing between all six of these energies. Unfortunately, very little theoretical knowledge exists for transients of more than double energy, in other words, a normal LC circuit. This is primarily due to limited understanding of the science of algebra with regard to solutions of equations higher than the second degree. So we're stuck with a situation here if we want to recreate a lot of this stuff is there's virtually no engineering math to do it. So we're going to go down now to the third post where one of the old Marconi ground screens still exists and was not pulled up. These grounds being for the coils, of course, here. We'll make a brief reference back to our diagram to show you how we're moving along here. I'll focus in on the diagram. I've got a shadow on it. There we go. I think people can deal with our uh, amateur production methods here. So we started at the end of the antenna, 
And now we're at the middle point, and we can see the neutralizing inductance here stood on these two platforms, being a pair of coils. All right. Now we're working our way down to the beginning where the input inductance and the input transformer existed, and then we're going to follow our way down to the plate. Okay, now part of the earth ground plate is still intact here, and we're going to see what kind of signals we can pick up off of our receiver. Technically, being that it's midday, the lower frequencies should be totally unreceivable, so we'll see what we can actually pick up out of the ground. So here we can show the diagram in this book here. Oh, uh, as we work our way down and we'll and have drawn the positions of all these concrete edifices here, then we'll see what an overview of the basic plan of the antenna looked like. Right. Let's get a little scan shot here to show how we've worked our way down here. And it was up there. Now we're going to move to behind us from where we're looking now. Okay, right. Remember how good it worked on the beach? Yeah. That was Peter's machine though, right? No, that was this. Really? Okay, what Eric's doing here now is we're hooked to one of the ground plates of the Marconi system. And okay, let me show them. Here's the ground stud right here. Can you see the copper stud? I believe we can there. I'm a, I just want to get an overall shot. Now I'm going to move up a little closer and see if I just want to show the basics. Can you just point to the main components there? Okay, here's the ground. There's a large uh, array of copper wires underneath the ground here that form like a large metal plate underneath the surface. And there's another ground post over here. Can you swing over here? Um, yeah, probably so. Oh, let's just keep here. We'll okay. just know there's another ground there. So coming out of ground, we're going to the earth terminal of our Tesla coil here, which is the usual flat spiral coil that we've been showing now in a number of our videos. The viewer is becoming familiar with this. Now we have a little plug-in elevated terminal that we can unscrew here and operate the thing with either no termination, which of course will be its highest frequency, or start loading it down with the capacitance of this little wire. This is basically a 2.3 megacycle coil without any capacitive loading. And then by adding this little whip on here, we can bring this down to the 160 meter amateur band. But there's really not too many transmissions anymore on these frequencies. And mostly what we'll pick up will be the intermodulation products of all the transmitters that are around here. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, we can find that as we tune through, we can pick up a considerable amount of electrical interference and other types of signals from power lines that are arcing the ground and serving as our transmitters. And then we'll operate on the higher frequencies in a little bit, which the coil inside the receiver will aptly handle, and show that we can pick up WWV right out of the ground, even though we're sitting right on top of the metal plane. And technically, it would be impossible to receive. We'll still pick up WWV off the ground rod, and in our experiments yesterday afternoon, the first station that came booming in was Radio Peking on a nighttime frequency, and the sun was still far up in the sky. I don't know if we'll be able to duplicate that today or not. Uh, okay, well, I'm going to move on a little closer so we can tune in here. What's this, a radio teletype okay, signal? This is a radio telegraphic signal that's emanating from the Coast Guard station about a mile up this strip here. Now, what we're going to do is pull the ground wire off and see how it affects our signal strength. Gone. Okay, now as you can see, there was no antenna on this. We removed the little whip. So we're definitely receiving purely through the earth. By ground, you mean virtual ground, right? Well, this is the virtual ground right. at this point. Now, you'll find when the coil finally reaches resonance, I'll go up in frequency, getting closer and closer to this resonance. And more signals can be heard in that point. Now you can see at resonance when I bring my hand, it's hard because the uh, camera has got an audio adjusting thing in it. So let's see, as I, as I ground this out with my body, the signal goes away. This is the virtual grounding arrangement here. I take the ground wire off and of course the signal goes away. So what's being done is 
This is providing its virtual ground and transformer action in one unit, and then the outer coil here picks off and goes to the receiver. What you can do is draw a simple diagram of this to help the viewer understand what's going on. Ready? Yeah. So here we have our receiver, which is, of course is our little unit over here. I was showing a bit, which you've already seen actually. And then we have the two large turns around the outside of the flat spiral Tesla coil. And then this is the many turns of the inner spiral of the coil, which is the resonating coil. It provides its own virtual grounding. So basically what's happening here is the resonant coil and the transformer are combined in one. Tesla's earlier coils operated on this principle operated a little wider bandwidth and higher powers this kind of level. Now as soon as we pulled the ground wire off of this as we heard the signal goes away and by bringing my hand near this tending to ground out this end of the transformer we found the signal goes away so we have to have complete isolation from ground here and then we can get our current flow between the earth and the coil by having one end free which of course is the opposite of the conventional system where these two terminals have to go off to transmission line and antenna arrangements. So we're definitely receiving directly out of the ground here and it should be pointed out that right underneath us is a large quantity of copper and normally in an electromagnetic situation operating this close to the ground it should be impossible to receive any of these frequencies. We can also see it's not just by induction into the coil, because when we pull the ground off, of course, the signal goes away, so the coil is not picking up magnetically what's coming off of the towers here. Now, what we're going to do next is we're going to go to the higher frequencies and see what we can pick up that way, just to show that there's no way that this is an electromagnetic form of communications will use the um, high frequency end of the receiver so that the coils inside operate as Tesla coils. We'll connect up the ground. Okay, we're here we're not really picking up quite as much now on this band, which can be expected. It's pretty quiet now without the interfacing transformer. But as we go higher, the receiver transformer will do the job for us. So what frequencies were we, were we receiving? We were operating in the 160 meter band, and a little above. Okay, we're going up now. We're getting a lot of overloading from the local transmitters. There's WWV. You know, we look at our arrangement here. All we have, let's put the headphones down close to the ground so they're grounded out, so no one can say that it's an antenna. That's probably loud enough to hear. We can see we have one very short wire to ground. We're sitting on the ground, and we're receiving out of it. Totally impossible by conventional electromagnetic theory. Yet, you can hear it with your own ears. Let's see what else we can pick up. Well, you're not a conventional magnetoelectrician, Eric. So this form of electricity is called magnetodielectricity rather than the conventional electromagnetism. We're going to go up to the um, broadcast band. We're picking up station here, English. Getting a lot of overloading from the transmitters. Uh, the only thing we can pick up now seems to be sounds like Radio China. We have to wait for them to identify themselves. I don't know if it can be heard or not. We're here very lightly. I turn the BFO, of course. 
carrier is a lot easier to hear. Right. And you can see you can still pick up many things throughout the band. This being one of the local transmitters. About seven words per minute, CW. Various uh, long distance shortwave broadcasting. Coast Guard transmitter. Here we have a parasitic oscillation. One of the transmitters around here is out of tune and oscillating on its own off frequency. So completing this, we're going to migrate a little further down to the actual primary ground connection that Marconi used. And get a picture of the building. Okay, here we are, working our way towards the beach. Fine way to spend an afternoon in California. And there it is, the Marconi Wireless Building. Once one of the most happening places on the planet. Now derelict and stuffed with junk. What we're going to do now is focus a little more on the organic side of this electricity and how it works with nature, being we're here out in nature. Again, we have our discharge here of this organic form now of mass-free electricity, monopolar electricity, or what you might call true single-phase electricity. And then we have a tree back here. Take a look at that. You can see the similarities and patterns between the photograph and the tree. It does look quite like one of the discharges. That's a characteristic of the cypress trees, is they look very much like electrical discharges that occur around these coils. And we're going to also see some very interesting ones down on the beach, patterns in the sand that are neither electrical nor organic, yet have the same pattern to them. Mm-hmm. Well, why don't we go take a look? Let's go take a look. So here we are at the input point of the antenna. This was the base for the input transformer, and this was the base for the first loading coil. And then all the wires came down off of the umbrella antenna. We have a 300-foot tower there that we can reference. It's right in the position where one of the original Marconi towers was. You can visualize three of those standing apart from each other by about the same distance and a big grid of wires going all the way up the piece of property we traversed. All those wires came right down to these concrete platforms here where the tension was taken up and then connected to the powerhouse. Now you can see there's a concrete over hole inside of the powerhouse building here where the lead wires came out. But that's this thing. Is that the square right there? Yeah. And then the alternators sat inside this building, this basically serving as a generating station. So is Marconi actually at this building? Yeah. He was involved with its construction. And there are rumors that Tesla was too, but we haven't been able to confirm that yet. But everybody was involved with this. That was a significance in the electrical pioneering days. Steinmetz would have been involved. There might have been some little involvement of Tesla, even though he was obviously at odds with Marconi on all this. Right. But it was mainly a general electric project. And General Electric at that point in time in history contained all the major scientists, electrical mm -hmm. researchers. So this was kind of a pinnacle of the, the modern electrical research of that era. 19, circa 1990. 1919 is when the building was under construction, and in 1920, RCA was formed to take control. There used to be a plaque here that said that, but the plaque was removed and placed in storage at Foothill College. And we can't get really get down there to take a look at it. We can get a look at the front of the building here, and then we'll follow the ground wires down to the beach where the plates are at and see what we can see down there. Okay, we're going to do a scan of the side of the building here. There's our technical support, our good friend Johnny, who's been helping out. You've seen his hand holding microphones. 
And there's the uh, concrete platforms we were just looking at. So there's the antenna field down here. Again, seeing how we've worked our way. You can see where we started up, way up in the distance there, by where the water tanks can be seen. You can see the little concrete platforms where we started from. Get an idea of the overall size of the Marconi antenna. Right. come back and do a building scan along here on the way back in. So Eric, at one time you actually had a lab in this building, didn't you? That's right. That's where I made the initial discoveries that Tesla's electricity was totally different than the type of electricity we're accustomed to using today. And of course, we're right on the ocean here now, this cliffs. You see a little shed over there. What's that? That used to contain one of the large transmitting coils for one of the wireless transmitters of higher frequency. There's a large Tesla coil in the building, and then the insulator on the roof is where the lead wire came out and connected to an elevated terminal. A piece of copper wire going up about 50 feet in space, and that served as the elevated capacitance. That would be one of the about 100 kilocycle transmitters, which is pretty right. much the highest frequencies they used back then. So that would be a Tesla transmitter there. Okay, and then that fed what was used to be on this concrete block? Oh, uh, it used to be on the concrete block was the large cooling tower to cool the uh, water jackets of the Alexanderson alternators, which because of their high uh, frequency were very inefficient. I see. That was the pond that the water sat in, and then there were baffles that rose up way above that that the water was scattered on so it could evaporate and dissipate its heat. They use ocean water? Oh, no, they'd have to use uh, distilled water for that. Engine jacket water. You know, the okay, there's a shot down the whole field, and we're at the back of the building here. Okay, what we're going to do now is follow the path of the ground wires down to the ocean. And we'll see where they come out of the cliff where it's broken off, and then we're going to take a look at the beach down there. So take a look at the, um, turn the camera down to the beach here. You can see the lay of the land in the reef. Now those lines are parallel to the San Andreas Fault, pretty much. Right, I think we can get a better shot farther down the beach of there. Yeah. Do a little 360 scan here slowly. See some of the lines down there. Swing around here and look at the land here. We find that Marconi put the ground in a very large, over a very large underground stream. So there's a natural draw to the land here to help facilitate the ground. Right. We, we, we might figure that Marconi might have known something about the lay of the land and orientated this antenna to meet the natural energy flow. Okay, let me get a shot of the surf out here too. We can see the orientation lines in the rocks here. But where is National Seashore property here? So let's go take a look at where the underground stream comes up out of the sand. Sounds good. There we see the coil building up on the cliff. Here's a little wash, I guess we could call it, that the ground wires come down. And we'll come down and start noticing these patterns here. Can you want to describe what we're looking at here, Eric? Okay, here's where the underground stream that rides underneath Marconi's old antenna emerges and comes out of the ground. Now what we're going to find, if we take a look at another spot that's more conducive for it, that this streaming of energy here in the water... We can see it pretty good there. ...behaves very much like the electricity we've just been talking about. Okay, focus in here. We're getting a good right, flow. This, this one here, it contains a little too much flow, and the sand's not really right to show some of the patterns we want to see. So let's move down the beach a little ways.
That way we're here at low tide. Okay, here we're looking at pretty prime one. You see the basic tree-like formation like we see in the discharges and see it in all of nature. Discharge of energy. Well, we can see the same organic pattern in here that we saw in the discharges coming out of the coil. So now we're starting to see somewhat of a correlation. These things look like the veins of living plants, yet they're just patterns in the sand caused by natural water flow percolating up from underneath underground streams. Okay, here we are a little further down the beach, not much farther, and there's this real extensive organic patterning here that I thought we would focus in on. And in particular, I wanted to show a streaming right about here. So you can see that the energy streams in natural living patterns. We can also see that the material flow that's going along with this is a minimal. It's carrying the grains of sand, but that's not the flow. analogous to the situation where electricity flows like the liquid, but electrons tend to act like the material particles and are carried along at a very limited velocity. Right. We can see a number of evolutionary patterns occurring in here, though, that eventually lead to the organic forms that we saw in the sand further back. Constantly changing. Let's go take a look at the next one. Okay. Oh. Here's a little spot where we can probably see the evolution and self-organization of these flows. There over to the right, we see where the flows self-organize into what it's almost like a little entity in the wave patterns that digs out a trough as it goes along. It's a self-organization that seems to create these lifelike patterns. Now we know we can take water and sand and shove it down a tube. It's like you take electricity and run it down a wire. If you let energy flow the natural way, you get quite different effects. Here's another one that started up over here. Okay, we'll move over to the end. Okay, there we go. See, right now it's in very severe oscillation, producing clockwise flowing little disturbances and standing waves. Now it'll evolve, change. Evolving pretty rapidly as we watch it. See a lot of changes. It's about to be a breakthrough there. We can notice by the standing wave patterns it's in a form of high frequency oscillation while it's occurring. something quite pleasing about watching nature. 
That's how Tesla made all of his important discoveries. It's by observation of nature. Let's move down to the next stream. Our batteries run out. Here we see a pretty complete one. In the first place it makes itself visible with the uh, water and sand medium. So we find that the archetypes of these forms pre-exist in space. But you can't map out space. These only appear when there's a discharge of different types of energy. Distinct. Clearly see the organic patterning. Of course, that organic patterns a stream. self-organized hole that carries itself along. I would recommend anybody that's interested in this to go to the beach and just watch. Doesn't Borderland have publications which talk about this? Well, we have the Adaphone voice figures from 1904, which actually shows these same patterns appearing in liquids that people were singing into. And uh, also has been released is uh, Hans Jenny's work with cymatics, with self-organizing patterns, which is absolutely stunning to see. There's also a book called Sensitive Chaos that the Steiner people put out, isn't there? Right. It's basically out of print. We were able to get a small number of copies. By the time this video's out, we'll probably be out. By Theodore Schwenk, an incredible book. It shows all these patterns through clouds, streams, trees. So what you see here is it looks like a discharge coming up, but as you can see the internal activity is the flow is moving downward towards the ocean. But yet if you compare it to the discharges that we saw, the discharges look like they're going up, just like a tree looks like it's going up. But in the view of many people, a tree, rather than growing out of the ground, it's actually sucked out of the ground and energy is filled in by cosmic energy coming down. Well, we can see a direct analog of that here. Right. Also, videos we took of the discharges occurring off the top of the Tesla coil showed that the discharges occurred from out in space and then propagated down inwards to the coil. Right, so discharge is, is a discharge from space into the coil rather than what would normally be assumed by just looking at it. So anyone can find these patterns in nature. All they have to do is get away from the buildings, the television set. You won't see much of this on TV. No, it's definitely not violent enough. No. OK, we've made it back up the cliff here, and we're looking out towards the southeast. And you can probably see lines, very distinct lines. Now it's quite interesting, I'm going to pan around behind me, and we're going to see by the way these lines parallel the San Andreas Fault. Right, the ridge over there is the big line. That's the other side of the fault. Right. Okay, we're on the uh, Pacific plate here. And down here, we're right square with building number one, the Marconi Wireless Building. So we can see the building was orientated along the lay of the land. And looking at the tower there, we can see where the antenna came out at right angles to the building, and therefore perpendicular to the fault line. 
in line with the underground stream but perpendicular to the fault. So it would right. seem Marconi knew something about the geography of the land and orientated his structure on it. Where if you look at the RCA structures up there, we see they're askew. They're built on the north, south, east, west. You can there see the go. angle of the building there is different than this one. We had a blueprint, right. it's very pronounced. Right. So these are built on the magnetic lines, right? Those are built on the conventional geographic lines of north, south, east, west. Okay. But the Marconi building is off by an angle, the angle that the San Andreas Fault is off by. Right, so um, according to ancient Chinese science of geomancy, the Marconi building would be quite in harmony with the Earth. And in fact, wasn't that what Marconi was doing, was using the Earth to broadcast? That's right. Marconi was using the Tesla system. Rather than what RCA is using now, which is just a force of electromagnetism being pumped through the ionosphere waveguide. So there it is. And just take a pan shot here. You can see the lay of the line goes even farther back into the deep canyon back there, which is one of their most lush organic areas in this part of Marin County. There's a vast antenna field. Okay, now the building is right to your back as you face these lines going out. It would be hard to believe that they just built it in line with all this on accident. Yes, that would be very difficult to believe. Considering being in that era, people were much more sensitive to earthly forces than they are now, where science has reduced it all to a technological process. We can even understand that in, like, um, we look at relativity. Like, now relativity is considered from the you know, macrocosmic uh, molecular level. Whereas in Steinmetz's book on relativity, he dealt with projective geometry, which dealt from the outer peripheral inward. So it was an inversion of consciousness. It definitely it is a Marconi wireless building. We're back about two hours later after another battery recharge. The sun's going down over the Pacific. Take a look here. What we really wanted to show you here, it's the RCA building again. As you can see there's uh, Transmission pole flittered around. Let's see, we'll come around to one right here. So basically, that's what's happening here is antennas are coming down research into the old Marconi and Tesla style systems is over. No real chance of it ever happening again. Like the setting sun, so goes the old science of electricity. Okay, we just noticed here in the sky, the same pattern in the clouds in the sky that we've seen down in the sands of the beach. And on the limbs of the cypress tree. And on the discharges off the tip of the Tesla coil. Maybe there might be some kind of connection here, don't you think, Tom? There's a slight chance of it. I'm beginning to think so. Final scan of this beautiful site here.
You never did one like this before. Mm -mm. Of course, you haven't had this camera that long either, huh? No. Yeah. 